All right, back week two of uh, our study on church history. Thanks to those of you who are joining in live or will be watching it later. Um, glad uh, for you to, to do this. If you remember last time when we were having this class last year, we studied theology. And so if you'd like to watch those, those are available on our YouTube channel. Otherwise, now we are on a 50 lesson study of uh, church history. And so I did get a, a question after last class, kind of, you know, what are the boundaries of church history? Um, I thought I thought maybe like Jewish history, the time before Christ would be included. And we could, if we kind of took a, a more general understanding of church history, we, we see that in Christ, the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles is broken down. And so the church doesn't replace Israel. Rather, the people of God are one. And so we could include church history from the time of creation all the way till current times. But typically on a more technical or um, narrow understanding of church history, we take that from the time of the apostles or even just past the apostles up till present time. And that's what we'll be studying. Uh, and so church history then uh, includes a time from Christ or the apostles up till present time, and that's what we'll be studying. Some housekeeping from last week. I think a list was requested of the books. I put in the chat, if you're able to see that, the book list. And so check that out. I also have a link there and in the description or the notes for today's class, a link to the document or to the outline that I'll be teaching from from today's class, if that would be of any interest to you. And so you can see that in the chat. Um, it's a Google Doc, and so it should just take you right to my notes, my outline. Some of it will make sense to you. Some of it are just notes for me that uh, will ring a bell in my head, remind me to talk about something, and so it may not make sense to you. Um, but uh, at least you'll have access to that. Okay, as always, please feel free to um, ask any questions throughout the class. We have the chat. You could email me, uh, jvandergallion at protonmail.com. You could text, um, message, whatever else. Uh, probably don't call during the class. That could be distracting. But I, I, I don't mind this being interactive, although I know the format maybe doesn't lend itself towards that. Also, as I'm teaching, if you see me looking up and to my right, I am looking at my outline. I have that there on another screen. Um, I have my books that I'm looking at over here to my left and my Bible kind of online app uh, to the upper my left. And so I may not always be looking at the camera, although I'll try to do that and maintain some kind of visual contact with you. Okay, I think that's it. Let me pray, and then we will jump into today's lesson on um, kind of historical background of Christianity. What's the world like that Christianity began in? Uh, so the soil Christianity took root in. Um, let's let's pray. Father, thank you for your church. We praise you for her, for the history of your faithfulness to your promises and the saving of your people. And so God, help us to learn from this, and, and not just only by learning new facts, which we praise you for, but also learning what faithfulness looks like, um, learning the, the great work that you've done through the power of your Holy Spirit and your Son to uh, build your church. We might bring you more glory and praise you. And so God, may this edify us, build us up, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so again, last week, church history. This is the study of the history of the church from the time of the apostles on. Uh, the benefit, of course, is what I've just prayed for. We get to see the glory of God's work in time in building of his church. And so um, it, 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 it's more opportunity for us to enjoy and delight in God to love him. Uh, it, the benefit is to learn. Uh, we, we've all heard many times the the phrase from ecclesiastes there's nothing new under the sun uh some of the battles that we fight today that we may think unique we'll learn aren't at all unique 
Um, and uh, so it, it really edifying. And then, of course, to see the example of many men and women who came before us and what faithfulness looked like in, in all circumstances. There's much benefit. So uh, today isn't yet getting into church history proper, but trying to lay some foundations for kind of the background, the world that Christianity began. What, what, was, what were the times like when Christ was on earth? What were the time like in the early apostles or early church? So world power at that time was Rome. Um, and we might, we'll, so we'll spend some time trying to just give a basic description of the Roman world. And then also uh, Israel, what was Israel like? If you have purchased kind of the textbook for this class that I'm using as my main resource, 2000 Years of Christ's Power, uh, volume one, it's in four volumes. So we'll be spending most of our time this fall in volume one. And so if you desire to purchase it, not require anything, but we are covering kind of the intro in chapter one today, and we'll get into chapter two next week. And so we're looking at the introduction on a, a chapter on time, and then the first chapter, historical backgrounds of Rome and Israel. That's what we're looking at. So first, um, Needham, the author of this volume, talks just about dates and time. And so I thought it, it might be helpful to you. Uh, you you've seen the, the abbreviations BC and AD, BC before Christ, AD, Anno Domini, um, or, or that those times in the year of our Lord, that is from the times from Christ on. So BC stands for before Christ. These are the numbers looking backwards before Christ's birth. And so if you see the number like 31 BC, that refers to 31 years before the birth of Christ. And so the numbers, as they move further from us or further from the time of Christ, get larger. And so 1 AD is just one year before Christ, whereas 753 or the founding of Rome was 753 years before Christ. So as the numbers get larger, they're moving further away from us. Uh, whereas AD, Latin, Anno Domini, uh, in the year of our Lord. And so these are the times from Christ's birth towards us. So, um, the numbers there get larger as they get closer to us, whereas BC, the numbers get larger as they move further away from us. Um, in Needham's book, he has this uh, little outline here. And so here's the birth of Christ. As you can see, the numbers get larger as you move further away from us. This is today. Uh, and so in 31 AD, um, you have Augustus's reign beginning the the first true um, Caesar, and then back here, 753, we, we would think that, um, you know, somewhere 4,000 years would be, be before Christ's birth of when we would date creation and, and so on. So, And then on the other side, AD, Anno Domini, uh, the, the, the times get larger as they get closer to us. Um, and so I don't know if that's helpful to you, but maybe you've had that question of what, what does BC and AD mean? There's a short lesson on that. All right. Also, uh, historically, centuries become important. Um, and so century, of course, is 100 years. Uh, and sometimes the dating gets confusing here because when we say the first century, we don't mean the years 101 to 200. We mean the years... Um, one to 100. And so the first century are, are the first 100 years, which are the years 1 to 100. And so then if we say the third century, we would be speaking um, of those numbers that really begin with the 2, 201 to 299. Um, and so it, I don't know if this is helpful to you. It, sometimes it was confusing to me when we, we are talking about centuries, you just kind of add one to the first number of whatever year. And so if we're in the year 205, add one to the number two, 205, that's the third century. There's a third 100 years from the time of Christ. Now, this uh, dating method of marking centuries uh, was developed by an Italian monk 
uh, Dionysius uh, in the year, lived around the year 500. So this, this wasn't how time was marked. In fact, uh, this dating system, apparently he didn't really use, and it wasn't adopted in the West uh, you know, until about a thousand years in the time of Christ or the 11th century. Um, I guess England adopted it in the 600 or the 7th century, Rome in 900s or the 10th century. Um, now, he also marked, you know, he dated everything from the birth of Christ. And so he kind of marked Christ's birth as year one or AD one. So he marked it all that he thought Christ was born about 753 years after the founding of Rome. Um, and so he marked everything as before that AD one as BC and everything after as AD. Uh, but he it's found out was likely off by a few years. And so even though uh, we would say AD one was the birth of Christ, Christ probably wasn't born until about four or so years after that. And so typically historians will say that Christ was born about 4 BC, just to make it more confusing for you all. All right, so there's a little bit on uh, BC and AD and counting by centuries. And then of course dates. As we go throughout the class, we'll be looking at kind of some of the more important or well-known personalities. And typically after their name, you'll have brackets that include their birth year dash to their death year. So uh, Martin Luther, born in 1483, died in 1546. So you'll see Martin Luther, parentheses, 1483 dash 1546. That's just giving you his life years from his birth till his death. Um, and then sometimes with names of rulers or popes, um, you'll have a Roman numeral after their name. And so let's say the third Roman emperor, Otto, is Otto with three lines, Otto the third, that, that means he's the third um, Roman emperor named Otto, uh, if you're ever curious about what that means. It's, it's really not all that important, but if you want to know what those dates and numbers mean, that, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so that's just a little bit on dating, uh, on time. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to chat, text, email, and I'll try to answer it. But he has a, a small chapter on that in this, and I thought maybe it would be helpful to some of you if you were curious about things like that. So if that bored you to death, uh, my apologies, but we'll move on now to actual historical background. So as I said, Christ was born of the Virgin Mary at a time when the Roman Empire dominated the Western world. And so by Western world here, we mean um, Julius Caesar was widely considered the, you know, first main emperor over Rome. Before that time, Rome was ruled mainly by the Senate. It, it, uh, an aristocracy, the wealthy elites who ruled kind of as a as a group, but there was a whole bunch of civil wars in the hundred years leading up to Christ's birth. So in the you know in the in the century before Christ's birth, uh, and it became necessary for the Senate to appoint um, a single ruler to restore order, and that 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 first one was. Julius Caesar. He was born in 102 BC and he was assassinated in 44 BC. Julius Caesar conquered and brought unity from what we would know as England, Spain in the west, all the way to Greece in the east, as far north as kind of the southern border of modern Germany, all the way south to northern uh, Africa. And so if you want to put a rectangular box on it, we're again from England and Spain on the west to Greece and kind of Eastern Europe on the east, north as far as 
southern Germany. So Germany really wasn't included in the Roman Empire. That was kind of the outer realms, the wilds. We'll hear more about that in coming weeks. And then as far north as northern Africa. So northern Africa was European and really was for a long time. So here, you know, those those four or five northern African countries were all part of the Roman Empire. In fact, some of the leading Christians that we'll talk about in the early centuries were in northern Africa. It was a mainly um, very Christian, cultured, important part of the world at that time. So anyways, uh, the Roman Empire was unified under loyalty and worship of the emperor, the first being Julius Caesar and, and then with the Senate. Um, some of the senators, Brutus and Cassius, conspired against Julius Caesar, thinking he was taking on too much power, and assassinated him, which touched off a new round of civil wars that was ended when Julius Caesar's nephew, which was Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavius, defeated Cassius and um, Brutus and others and became the first true Caesar. So he was given the title by the Senate, Augustus Caesar. Now that name should be familiar if you're at all familiar with the Bible. In Luke chapter one or chapter two, verse one, it reads, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Caesar meaning king. Augustus, the title given by the Senate, you know, meaning kind of the august one, the, the supreme one. And so Augustus Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar's adopted son, his nephew, was ruling over that Roman Empire and was its greatest um, and most benevolent uh, Caesars, kings. Um, and he was ruling at the time of Christ. And he's the one who made the decree that all of the Roman Empire needed to be registered. And so that's what prompted Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem right when Mary was about to give birth. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Uh, if you weren't aware of that, that's the historical background there. But anyways, all that to say, Rome ruled the world at that time. And Rome ruled the, the, the area that we know as Palestine, um, where Christianity was birthed, where Christ was born and ministered, and where the apostles were at that time. So uh, unified under this single, all-powerful Caesar, at that time Caesar Augustus, Augustus Caesar. So, and then later on, emperor worship became a mainstay as, as part of uh, Roman religion, but more on that in a moment. So Rome un united under a single ruler, a common economy throughout that all world, a massive trade network tied together by roads, tied the entire world together. This will become important, as we'll see next week, that the apostles, really because the Jews, as we'll see, were spread all throughout the Roman Empire, especially in some of the major cities with roads and trade tying these all together it made it rather um possible for the gospel to spread really quickly throughout the old roman empire because it was a single cultural tied together by a semi single economy all with a vast road network maintained by the roman empire and so that roman culture was actually not roman culture but greek culture the 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 world power before rome were the greeks Alexander the Great conquered much of Eastern Europe, the Middle East. And so the Greek language, kind of the common tongue at that time, the time of Christ and the apostles, and that culture, which to be the historians will call it the Hellenistic culture, um, was, was the dominant culture in the Roman Empire. Um, and so when Rome conquered the world, Rome itself had been conquered by this Greek Hellenistic culture. And so that's why the New Testament's written in Greek and why the Greek philosophers, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, you, you'll hear some of these things, Plato and um, Stoicism and so on. This is very influential 
on uh, Christ Christianity. In fact, uh, many of the early Christian leaders at the time of the apostles came out of um, Platonism. Uh, and, and so again, just, just to say that the dominant political power in the world is Rome. Rome was uh, united under a single ruler and tied together that known world under a common economy and a common kind of Greek Hellenistic culture. All right, the religion at the time of Christ and the apostles in, in Rome was, the demo was just paganism. What's paganism? Paganism is the worship of different gods who kind of ruled over different aspects of life, all under the chief god. You've heard the name Zeus or in Latin, sometimes called Jupiter or Jove. And so you have, you know, a god of the sea, um, Neptune, you have the, the, the god of love, the god of war, and all under Zeus. And so paganism was trying to get these gods to be benevolent towards you and not angry with you so that they would harm you, but benevolent towards you so that your crops would grow and your family would expand and your bank account would grow. And so they lived in fear of these gods, tried to obtain their blessing through sacrifice and prayer and worship and trying to, through dreams or visions or consulting the priests or other matters, trying to figure out what the will of the gods were so you could follow them. And, and as paganism developed, the emperor was kind of the chief priest and, and later really a god. And so emperor worship became part of being Roman. Um, Rome was really successful and, and it was common for the Romans to see the hands of God through the emperor to be the reasons for the success. And so the emperor himself, past emperors, especially maybe the founders of Rome and so on, became deified long after their death. And so it was kind of a common practice to include among all of the pagan gods, previous now deceased emperors as part of those they worshiped. Well, then it became part where the living Caesar was God incarnate, became godlike in status so that the worship of the gods and the worship of the living emperor were kind of one. And this is what Christians refused to do. Oh, they refused to worship the, the gods, and so they were often charged with atheism, but they refused to worship Caesar. So Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, was a radically political statement that brought great persecution and suffering for Christians because they refused to say Caesar is Lord. And this is important because to the, the peace of Rome hinged on the worship of their gods and, and hinged on the worship of Caesar. And so a Christian who refused to do that um, was seen to be causing trouble for the um, empire. Uh, and, and so this was a big deal. So religion tied Rome together, um, and, and, and in particularly the, the worship of the emperor or the Caesar. All right, so religion's important, but so is philosophy. Philosophy dealt with how do humans live the good life? What is wisdom? What is morality? Uh, and the dominant um, philosophy at the time was Platonism. Um, all philosophy flows from this, what many would consider the first philosopher, Plato. Um, Platonism really had, uh, among all of the different philosophies, the most in common with Christianity because they, Plato and, and Platonists, taught that, held that there was only one eternal God who is unchanging. There was a great focus in Platonic thinking and in, in, in Plato's thinking on moral improvement, on having an eternal soul. Um, no, I'm not saying all Platonists are Christians, of course not, but of all of the philosophies, um, it, it had some 
truths, especially some central truths, much in common with Christianity. And so all truth is God's truth, and Platonists had some of it. Uh, so so that that's Plato, and many of, as I said before, er, some of the early Christian leaders that we'll meet in coming weeks came out of this worldview and were greatly influenced by it. Um, another uh, philosophy that was around that time is called Epicureanism. They taught that pleasure is the highest ideal, not pleasure as in self-indulgence and self-pleasure, but true happiness, true felicity on this earth. The kind of the, the highest moral living was attained through self-control, peace with others, and quietness of life. So there's much to commend it. Now, they didn't believe in any kind of life after death. Platonists did. Epicureanism didn't. The gods don't care about the mankind. In fact, the gods are the problem. It was kind of this fear of the gods that brought so much fear on among mankind, fighting and so on. And so they were agnostic. We don't really know about the gods. We don't care about the gods. It's really just live your best life, kind of true happiness by living well, living morally, self-control and so on. Uh, another one, another ph philosophical tradition alive all the time is Stoicism, which you may have heard of. Stoics were materialists. Um, all you see is all you get. And Stoicism, we, we, we use that word. He, he, he or she is stoical. They're, they're very stoic. That is, um, we find fulfillment through self-control, through discipline, through a suppression of the emotions. Um, which Christians, of course, we believe self-control is very important, but emotion, self-control isn't uh, opposite of emotions. We, we believe that the emotions need submitted to Jesus Christ, but feeling anger or fear or love or happiness are good so long as they're under the control of Christ. Well, Stoicism would deny that. You need to get rid of the emotions and come to this kind of stoical, self-controlled um, kind of life, and that that's the highest good. So anyways, all of these philosophies are are striving at what? how can man live the greatest life? How can we live the good life? And this is not a bad question. Uh, Christianity is very concerned about this. But we know that the only way is by faith in Jesus Christ, and that that faith living out in love for God and love for others, that is the greatest good. And so we have to let go of our selfish desires in order to serve Christ and Christ's people and the good of mankind in general. So that's a brief snapshot of the Roman world, you know. And so I just spent 15, 10, 15 minutes doing that where volumes and volumes of books have been written. But anyways, this is the world that... Christianity was birthed in, a world dominated by the Romans, worship of the empire, worship of the gods, a common economy under this Greek Hellenistic culture where Greek is the main language and the arts and so on are big. And then, um, you know, the, the love of philosophy, which we see in, in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. All right. So Roman, the Roman empire is big part of what Christianity came into, but so is Judaism, um, Judaism. So here, here we're talking about the Jews um, centered mainly in Palestine, um, the area around Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, by that time, though, of course, about 400 years before Christ, the Jews were rejected by God, conquered, uh, and dispersed throughout the world. Um, and so by the time of Christ, of course, you still have Palestine as a central of the Jewish religion, but by that time there were Jews and Jewish enclaves within all of the Rome, Greek-speaking world, and the worship by that time wasn't necessarily centered around the temple any longer, although the temple still stood. It was within synagogues 
under synagogue leaders all throughout the jo uh, Roman world. Now, the Jews by this time were no longer a, a self-governing autonomous nation. They had been conquered and brought under Roman rule um, in the time of Julius Caesar and just before him. But during Julius Caesar's, all political power had been removed from the Jews, mainly. I mean, they still maybe had some local control here and there, but they, they no longer are in charge of themselves. Judea was made a Roman province with an appointed kind of Jewish king, Herod. You've heard of him. Uh, there were Jewish rebellions against this Roman rule, and in 6 AD, so just a year or two or three after Christ's birth, the Jews rebelled, and it was just smashed down by Rome. And so Rome placed Judea, the area in Palestine where the Jews had, under direct Roman rule of a Roman-appointed governor, Pontius Pilate. So no longer were they even allowed their own Jewish king, who was subservient to uh, the Roman Emperor Caesar. Now they have a Roman appointed governor who, who governs just that land of Judea. And so the, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, is over the military and police, over taxes, over matters of law and justice. Um, the Jews did maintain some allowance for freedom to worship as they desired. And so along with pagan worship, uh, and, and maybe a few other very small religions, Judaism was allowed to continue. And, and even in Judea, under the Roman appointed governor Pontius Pilate, they had some local control over matters of law under the Sanhedrin. We see this during Christ's um, uh, arrest and interrogation that this Roman or this Jewish body of law, the Sanhedrin, interrogates him first, and then he's handed over to the Romans to be put to death. So as I said, they were allowed some religious freedom, and there were four kind of competing religious sects in Judaism, which you've heard of, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots. One of the disciples, Simon, was a Zealot, and the Essenes. You maybe heard of them because of uh, their work in copying Bible and manuscripts and Qumran and so on. Those last things. So the Sadducees were, if you want to think about it this way, liberal. They didn't believe in the entire Old Testament, only in the Pentateuch. They didn't believe in any life after death, no angels, no demons. But they were the priestly, wealthy, elite class that had the most pull politically and over life in Judea. So the Sadducees are an important. Um, and we see them interacting with Christ and Christ uh, correcting them. And then the Pharisees. You've heard a lot about the Pharisees. They're all over the Gospels. They're, they're a conservative party. Their name means the pure ones. They're largest numerically, though not largest in power, largest numerically. They had a ton of influence over Jewish life. And their main concern, which is the right concern, was obedience to God. They, they wanted obedience. They were the purity party. Um, they they uh, really had a commitment to scripture, Old Testament. They accepted it all. They believed in life after death. And so Jesus would have been mostly closely associated with this group. Um, I, I read, and I don't remember where, that Jesus was likely a Pharisee in the sense of he, of course, believed that Old Testament was God's word. He believed that there was life after death, that God was judged, and that we did need to live in obedience to God. But of course, as we know, the Pharisees had gone beyond Scripture and were very legalistic and harsh and demanding, and the power had gone to their head. And so Jesus was, in a sense, a critic of the Pharisees from within. He wasn't just an, an outsider correcting the Pharisees. He, he, he would have been um, most in common with the Pharisees, and so was its harshest internal critic. Um, and so that's the Pharisees. And then the Zealots were kind of the extreme, far-right, militaristic, working subversively to undermine and liberate the Jews from Roman rule. They were behind the Great Trouble in 6 AD and the rebellion against Rome. They were behind it again in 70 AD when Rome came in and devastated Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. 
Um, and so they were attractive to many Jews also. And then the Essenes kind of broke away from ordinary life, gathered in small religious co communities where they kind of lived communally. Um, they wanted kind of strict separation from Rome, even from contemporary Judaism. So most Jews, as I said, did not live in that area of Judea. The, the greatest number were scattered throughout the Roman Empire in major cities and small areas. They often lived and gathered together in these in Roman cities as a Jewish part of the city, separate from Gentiles. Life revolved around synagogue worship. And there were Gentile converts to Judaism. We see these in scriptures, the God-fearers. And Christianity was originally thought within the Roman Empire to simply be a Jewish sect. And so it was protected from Jewish or from Roman persecution for a time, thinking that they were just a part of Judaism. Um, but as Jewish-Roman relations degraded, which erupted in the great Jewish war from AD 66 to 73 that resulted in the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple in, in, in the AD early 70s, and persecution of Christians really increased when it became clear, mainly because the Jews were constantly saying that Christians are not Jewish. Um, and so Christianity was removed from under the umbrella protection of sanctioned Jewish worship and seeing that it wasn't Jewish. Uh, and so that, so we'll have an entire class in uh, week seven on persecution in the early church. And I'll be using this book by Vince Workman, published by Clear No Press on persecution Larry Church, which is uh, considered the, the best resource on this subject, um, uh, that Christians were charged in the early uh, first two or three centuries with treason, right? They were subversive against the Roman Empire because they wouldn't worship. And, and so anarchy, and atheism because they wouldn't worship the Roman pagan gods. You know, all three of these are related to what we've just learned about the Roman Empire. The, the, the central reality of the Roman Empire was the cohesiveness, the peace of the Roman Empire under the, under the emperor, under the Caesar. And that was only obtained by the blessing of the gods and by the worship of the emperor, which Christians refused to do because we worship only one God, one triune God in Christ. And then because of the conflict between Judaism and Rome and because of the allowance for Jews to continue to worship, uh, and as Christians separated and saw Gentiles coming into the kingdom and other Jews, the Jews began to hate Christians and would call them out. And so the Christians were under pressure from Rome and from Jews. And so that, that's the soil that Christianity took root in. Okay, so that's all for today. I know that's a lot. Uh, we, we covered quite a bit here, but, you know, that, that's just the beginning. So, as again, if, if you are getting this, uh, the, the first chapter is about this in a bit more depth. And so feel free to check that out. And if you have any questions, please um you know, text, email, give me a call. I'd be glad to discuss it. Uh, so from here on out, we will actually begin talking about specific, uh, the, the, the birth of Christianity, the early church. Next week, we'll be discussing the apostles. And so we'll be discussing the book of Acts uh, and, and how, and you know, Christianity was established. So that's it. Thanks for joining uh, both live and those in person. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. See you. Bye.